All right, guys, um, like I said, this is probably going to be a long sermon, so I understand if the kids get a bit cranky and you need to get out. I really wanted to cover this chapter as a whole because it all comes together. Now, if you haven't been coming to church on a weekly basis or you're new here, you haven't been here for a while, what we do on a Tuesday is we tend to go through the Bible chapter by chapter. We've been going through the book of Matthew, okay, and we're finally now up to Matthew 24. So the last time I preached, was, which was two weeks ago, we went through Matthew 23. We're now up to Matthew 24. Now, this is a chapter that's uh, heavily debated, okay? Now, when it comes to the style of church that we are, we are an independent, fundamental Baptist church. And I won't go through all the reasons why that's the case, okay? But I'm strong on those labels. I'm strong on those titles that we have as a church. But one thing I want you to understand is that most independent, fundamental Baptist churches uh, we will not preach what I'm about to preach today. Okay? In fact, many of my brethren hold a different position than what I do okay? and what this church holds. So maybe some of you have never heard this type of preaching before. Okay? But most independent fundamental Baptists believe in a, what they call a pre-tribulation rapture, meaning that prior to a period known as the tribulation period, you know, the, the, the believers will be taken up with Jesus Christ into heaven and God will come and destroy the earth. Okay? But the position that I hold and the position that's been held by this church is a post-tribulation, pre-wrath rapture. You say, what is that about? Well, just listen up and we'll go through this here in Matthew 24. Okay? So, number one, the reason why it's probably going to be a long bit of a long sermon, number one, it's, there's a lot of verses, as you saw there, with Bible reading. But number two, I've also, can't just preach what it says, which I, I wish I could, that's all I could do. But I also have to dismantle or take down other positions that people hold so it makes sense as you read through this. Because I'm sure many of you, uh, when you look at these verses, you're familiar with them, but you've probably been taught something else about these verses. Now, for example, Matthew 24, many pastors will say to you, that's not a chapter for you. It's not for you. It's for the non-unbelieving Jews. It's for the unbelieving Jews. It's not for the believer, they'll say. Okay, now just can I say a show of hands just very quickly? Who's been to churches or who's, who's been taught the pre tribulation rapture before? Can I just say a show of hands just to get an idea? Pre tribulation, okay, cool. Put your hands down. Now, how many of you, just, just you don't need to put your hands up, but just how many of you in this chapter alone in Matthew 24, in order for them, first of all, look, like I said, they say this is not a chapter for us, it's not for the New Testament churches, it's for the unbelieving Jews, they'll say, right? But how many of you have heard them use verses from this very chapter to teach on the pre-trib rapture? Let me give you some examples. You guys are there in your Bibles in Matthew 24, verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. The Bible says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Man, I'm sure you've all heard pastors use that. You know, no man knoweth the day or the hour, right? And so it's a pre-tribulation. No, hold on, it's Matthew 24. It's in Matthew 24. What about verse 37? But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. How many times have you heard that? People saying, hey, like the days of Noah, that's what it's going to be like when Christ comes and raptures his church. Or what about verse 40? Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. I mean, how many of you have heard that for a pre trib rapture? I know I have. Many times. Many times. What about verse 44? Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Man, I've heard those verses, I don't know about you guys that put your hands up. I've heard those verses used time and time again for a pre-tribulation rapture for the church. Okay? But when you look at it, the other verses, oh, that's not for you. It's like, what? Hold on. You can't, you can't play these games. Either this chapter's for us, or it's not for us. And if it's not for us, and you believe in a pre-trib rapture, well, where are your verses for a pre-trib rapture? Well, I've got to turn to Matthew. Why do you go to Matthew 24 if it's not for us? That's my point, okay? Now, look, our position is very different. I like to take the Bible as it's written, okay? Now, did Jesus Christ speak certain words to the unbelieving Jews? Absolutely. And if you were here for the last three chapters that we've gone through, Matthew chapter 21, 22, 23, we saw time and time again Jesus Christ coming up against the unbelieving Jews, coming up against the Pharisees and taking them down. You know, they were, they were arguing, they were trying to find faults in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ just tears them up, okay? So we saw how he deals with the unbelieving Jews. Now, before I go on, just look at verse number 29, please. Matthew 24, verse 29. The Bible says, Immediately after the tribulation 
of those days shall the sun be darkened. The title for the sermon tonight is After the Tribulation. After the Tribulation. I do believe the rapture will take place after the Tribulation of those days. Okay, And I'm going against... The common teaching, which is, well, the rapture is before the tribulation, before the tribulation, okay? Now, first of all, is Jesus just speaking to the non-believing Jews here? Is that, is that what this chapter is about? Let's have a look at this, okay? Now, um, look, I've got a lot of verses to go through. I don't expect you to keep up with me, okay? But if you guys just want to get the most out of this sermon, keep Matthew 24 open and Revelation chapter 6, okay? So keep one finger there and the other verses, so those verses I'll give you time to turn to, Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6, but all the other verses, I'm just going to spit them out to you, okay? So either take down notes or you can go back and listen to this sermon later on if you need to do further study, okay? But one thing you need to understand uh, is that here in Matthew 24, in Matthew 24, um, it says, well, let, let me just start off by Luke 21, 37. It says, and in the daytime, this is talking about the time, the final week that Jesus Christ had before he was crucified. It says, and in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. Okay. And that's when he would come face to face with his, with, with his, um, with his uh, you know, uh, the unbelieving Jews. That's when he would come face to face with the Pharisees in the temple. And then it says, and at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. Okay, so this final week when Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem, he would spend the day in the temple teaching. And then at night when he was done, he would go into the Mount of Olives. Matthew 24 is taught at the Mount of Olives. Okay, so where is he? He's on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. That's where they're staying the night. So when he comes to what the, word, the words of Christ being taught here, he's not speaking to the unbelieving Jews. He's speaking to his people. He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to those that believe on him. Okay? Now, they'll say, well, see, no, this is not for you. And this is, look at Matthew 24, verse 16. Matthew 24, verse 16. They say, look, this is not for you, you Australian. You Gentile Australian with a Chilean background. It's not for you. It's for the Jews. They'll go to Matthew 24, verse 16. Look at this. It says, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. See? It's for those that live in Judea, right? It's, uh, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. It's for them. Who lives in Judea? They'll say it's the Jews. Well, you know the Palestinians also live in Judea. You know, there are many Christians that live in Judea. There are many uh, 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 tourists that, that go into Judea all the time. I mean, it's not just the Jews. There's lots of people that live in that area of Judea today. And many of them are the Palestinians, okay? But first of all, look, it says, then let them, let them, okay? Now look at verse 16, Matthew 24, verse 16. Oh, sorry, sorry, verse 4. Matthew 24, verse 4. I'm just going to rattle these off to you. In that verse, it says, deceive you. Okay? So there is a them and there is a you. Look at verse number six. It says, and ye. All right? You see those words? And then it says, see that ye. All right? And verse, verse number nine. Look at Matthew 24, verse nine. Deliver you, kill you, and ye. Now, let me ask you something. If someone says you and then them, is it the same group of people? It's not the same group of people, okay? You is the people that Jesus is speaking to, okay? And the them are others that he's referring to, okay? Others that he's referring to. And the them were in Judea. So he's speaking to you. Who's he speaking to? Those that are on the Mount of Olives, his disciples, his believers. Now, what I want you to see here is um, I'm going to... Actually, this is, this is a verse I want you to turn to. Please go to Mark 13, verse 3. Mark 13, verse 3. Mark 13 verse, this is important to turn to because it gives us the context of who Jesus Christ is speaking to specifically. Mark 13 verse 3, it's the same story, it's a parallel passage. Mark 13 verse 3, it says here, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, over against the temple, who's Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Hey, who are these men? Are they non-believing Jews? They're the ones that come and ask Jesus these questions, which leads him to preach on this chapter in Matthew 24. Who are they? Non-believing Jews? Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his apostles. In fact, he's speaking to the men that would start the New Testament churches. The men that would go out and preach the gospel. Okay? And uh, look at, drop, drop down to verse 37 now. Mark 13, verse 37. 
Because some people say, look, look, yes, he's speaking to his disciples, but he's not speaking to their saved parts. He's speaking to their unsaved Jewishness. It's like, what in the world? <laughs> he's speaking to their unsaved Jewish. Look, these guys are saved, okay? They're believers. These, you know, and uh, look at verse 37 anyway. Even if you held that position that Jesus was speaking to, yes, saved people, but he was really referring to their unsaved Jewish uh, flesh. Verse 37, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Say, it's not for us. Who's all? <laughs> what in the world? The Bible says, what I say unto you, disciples, my, my saved apostles, I say unto all, watch. Okay? So, you know, please don't be fooled into thinking that Matthew 24 or the Olivet Discourse, as it's known, is not for you. It's for all. It's for all. And specifically, it's for his believers. Okay? Please go back to Matthew 24, verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. And, I, you know, I just wasted time, right? I mean, I shouldn't have to cover that. Just anyone that reads the Bible should go, Matthew 24, okay, yeah, let's read what the Bible says. Let's, but see, now I've got to waste time explaining why people say it's not for you, all right? And show you why it is for you. Matthew 24, verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So we saw that in the daytime, he'd be in the temple and his disciples came to him. Now we know which disciples they were because of Mark, right? His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall, not be, uh, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now these are words of Jesus. What did he say? There's not going to be a single stone of the temple left upon another. But is it just the temple? Now look at verse number 20, 21. They, the disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So every building, every wall, every part of that temple, Jesus Christ says there'll be uh, left here not one stone upon another, okay? That shall not be thrown down. That's what, that was a prophecy of Jesus Christ. When was this fulfilled? In 70 AD. 70 AD, Jerusalem would be burnt. The temple would be destroyed. Now, why am I bringing that up? It's because in Israel today, the Jews... They've got the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. Do you guys, have you heard about that? The Wailing Wall. They've got this wall and they basically say their prayers to it and they, they bow their heads to it like this. All right. And they say, hey, that wall is part of the temple, part of the, old, you know, the temple that we used to have. And so, we, you know, this is all we've got now to worship God. So we come here and we, we, we worship and we pray to this wall here because it was part of the temple. But if it was part of the temple, then what Jesus Christ said was not fulfilled. He said, not one stone would be left upon another of all the buildings of the temple. Okay, so let me tell you, let me ask you something. If what Jesus said is true, do you think that wall then is part of the temple? Couldn't be. Couldn't be. Okay. Who do you think is a liar? Jesus or Judaism? <laughs> Who do you think? Look, I, I, I've been attacking them a lot lately. Okay, but look, this is look. Jesus Christ is true. None of the buildings will be left, okay? None of them. And sure enough, it wasn't. If you do some research into that, the wall, the Wailing Wall, is part of a Roman fortress, okay? It's part of a Roman fortress known as Fort Antonia. So just, if you just want to do your research, just go online, look up Fort Antonia, and you'll understand that Wailing Wall is not anything to do with the temple, because Jesus Christ would be destroyed, totally was. It's just part of a Roman uh, fortress, which is just ridiculous. I mean, to be praying toward, I mean, praying toward any wall is ridiculous, all right? Let alone a wall that had nothing to do with the temple in the first place, okay? So, and what's ridiculous about that, just not, it's not just the Jews that do that, guys, but you have powerful men, you have leaders, you have presidents, prime ministers of other nations go into that wall and praying to it. What idolatry, idolatry, you know? And that's, you know, when you, when you move away from Christ, when you move away from the word of God, you're going to end up in false religion. And Judaism today is a false religion, okay? Matthew 24, verse 3, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed. Take heed means listen. All right, listen. Pay attention that no man deceive you. That no man deceive you. This is why it's important for us to preach Matthew 24. Jesus wants us to learn so we would not be deceived. Man, if people are saying to you, don't read it, it's not for you. That sounds like deception to me. Yeah. All right, it sounds like someone's trying to lie to me. 
All right? No. And this is why it's so important when it comes to the end times that sermons like this is filled with scriptures. You don't want to hear my opinion. Right? You don't want to hear my opinion. I don't want to hear my opinion. I want to, I want to uh, tailor this scripture or, or this, this uh, doctrine of the end times with many, many scriptures. That's why you've got Matthew 24 in one finger and the other fingers there in, in uh, Revelation chapter 6 and many more passages that we can, we're going to go to. Go to okay? The more scriptures we've got, the less likely we're going to fall into problems and lies and heresies and being deceived. Verse number five. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Hey, there are others that are going to come calling themselves Christ. And when it comes to the end times, who's going to call himself or who's going to be like Christ? Who's going to refer to him as Christ? A lot of you guys know him as the Antichrist. The Bible also calls him the beast. Okay, the beast or the Antichrist. And then verse number six says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Do you get troubled? Do you get worried when you start hearing about wars on the news and, and rumors of wars? And just recently there's been like the United States might go and attack Iran because they shot down an unmanned drone. Does that concern? Do you get worried about that? If you do, Jesus says, see that ye be not troubled. Okay? For us as believers, it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter to us who's going to war. It's not our problem. Don't be troubled by that. We've got our business to do. We've got our work to do. You know, we're, we're just passing through. You know, this nation's not our own, not, not ours. You know, we're, we're looking to the heavenly kingdom. Okay, we're looking to new heavens and the new Jerusalem. That's what matters to us, you know. But now what I want you to do is please make sure you stay in Matthew 24. Go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1. Because let's look at someone that would come as Christ. Because that's what Christ said. There's going to be some coming like him in Revelation chapter 6 verse 1. This is the, uh, the, the, the seals. You know, the, 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 the seals, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, the seven seals. It says here in verse number one, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. What did we just read about in Matthew 24? There'll be some coming saying they are Christ. And this he, the man riding on the white horse, is the Antichrist. He is the beast of the book of Revelation and he's coming conquering nations. Okay? And we know his end goal is to basically take over the entire world. But it starts off here with the first seal, his conquering nations. Go back to Matthew 24, please. Matthew 24, verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. So if this guy's out conquering, what do we expect to see in Matthew 24? If the Bible's aligned. Verse number 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Okay, kingdom against kingdom. Go back to Revelation 6, please. Revelation 6, verse 3. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Hey, this sounds like Matthew. Kingdoms against kingdoms. The wars are going on. And the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 6 with the second seal, that peace has been removed from the earth. Why? Because the earth is at war. There's some type of big major world war going on at this time, okay? Back to Matthew 24, verse 7. We didn't finish verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. It says, And there shall be famines. There shall be famine. What's famine? A lack of food, right? A lack of food. Famines. Go back to Revelation 6, verse 5. Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And you'll see how the Bible's perfectly consistent with these things. Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And, beheld, and I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay? So just very quickly, all I want to take there in verse number six, when the third seal is open, is that a measure of wheat, just buying, let's say, you know, a kilo of, of flour or something for wheat, of wheat to make bread, he says, for a penny. Now, if you've been here in the previous weeks, we saw how a penny equated to a day's wage. Okay, 
So just think about that for a moment. Let's say, I mean, I know it's a day's wage is probably more than this, but let's say, let's say a day's wage is 100 bucks, just you know, for sake of saying something simple. Well, for 100 bucks, your whole days of working, all you can afford at that point in time is a little bit of flour, just a measure of wheat, okay, to, to do that. So you can see um, hyperinflation, you can see the value of money, you know, basically deteriorating, and you see a lack of food. And why, why is that? It's because the world's at war. And quite often when the world is at war, there are places that have been affected, you know, they lose the value of their money, they can't get the food that they need, and so we see these things playing out. Now go back to Matthew 24, please. Matthew 24, back to verse 7. We haven't finished it yet. Matthew 24, verse 7. Then it says, And pestilences... Now what are pestilences? It's disease, sicknesses, okay? There's going to be disease and sicknesses upon the earth and earthquakes in diverse places. Back to Revelation 6 now. Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. We're up to the fourth seal. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and, be and behold, a pale horse. Man, if you see someone looking pale, what do you think about them? What do you say about them? You look a bit sick, don't you? You're looking pale. You're not looking well. A pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. I don't want to go, I, I'd love to go through all of that, but we need to move on. Okay? But you can see the pestilences that were in Matthew 24. We see the pale horse. And we see people just dying. You know, a fourth of the earth basically perishing with all these things. The wars, the famines, the sicknesses, all these things, people perishing. Back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 verse 8. Matthew 24 verse 8. And then Jesus says these words. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay? Say what things? The things we just talked about, okay? The four, the four horsemen, the, uh, the Antichrist, false Christ or the Antichrist, the, the wars, the, the, the famines, the pestilences, all these things. Jesus Christ calls this the beginning of sorrows. Now, one thing I want you to understand, have we seen anything at this point in time about believers being persecuted? No, it's just the entire world suffering. The entire world is at war. Of course, I guess you could say believers are probably suffering as well because the whole world is. But, you know, it's not something that's targeting believers. Okay, that's what that's what it's called. The beginning of sorrows. We now turn to a new part of the end times. Instead of the entire world being persecuted, we're going to now see the believers of Christ being persecuted. Okay, now look at uh, verse number nine, verse number nine, Matthew 24, verse nine. Then, so after the beginning of sorrows, right? Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations. Why? For my name's sake. Whose name? Who's speaking? Jesus Christ. Say, man, it's for the Jews. The Jews don't love Jesus Christ. They hate Jesus Christ. They're not going to be persecuted for the name of Christ. Are you kidding me? This is about believers. Okay, if you're a Christian, okay, you've got the name of Christ then you'll be persecuted for his name. You're not going to be persecuted because you're a Jew. You're being persecuted because you're a Christian. Okay? Now, back to Revelation chapter 6, please. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And we can see again the consistency of the Bible. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. Why? For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. That's what we saw in Matthew 24. Verse number 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So who's killing these people? The unbelieving world. Okay? And these, these people that have died for the name of Christ, for the word of God, they're asking God, they're asking Jesus, How long, God, how long before you take vengeance upon those that killed us? Verse number 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay? But look in Revelation 6, 9 again. Why were they slain? They were slain for the word of God. Hey, who's the word of God? <laughs> it's Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus Christ. Again. These people that have been killed or been persecuted by this world and the Antichrist are believers. Okay, not non-believing Jews. It's so ridiculous to hold that position. I don't know why. Okay, the scriptures are so clear. 
Back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse number 10. Matthew 24, verse 10. And then shall many be offended. Man, I feel like we're living these days right now. Everyone gets offended so easily. Right? Everywhere, you, you just make a joke and everyone's like, oh, I can't believe you said that. You know, you say something, you, you know, you say something, just you teach the Bible and people get offended these days. Man, people don't have thick skin anymore. People don't know how to brush off insult and they just, everyone just is easily offended. You know, for those of you kids, young ones that are known as millennials, I feel sorry for you because your generation, man, it's the offended generation. All right? Now, my generation wasn't that great either, but I'm just saying, man, you guys are getting, you guys are, you guys are gonna, ah. I'll be praying for you guys. I'll just put it that way, okay? Verse number 10, And they shall, and shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. I haven't got time to go through this right now, but in the book of Revelation, there's a false prophet that will point people to the Antichrist of the beast as the man to be worshipped. But verse number 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Okay, so the natural love that people have in the world, it's all going to wax cold. Why? Because of the iniquity, because it's going to be exceedingly sinful in these days. Verse number 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, let me tell you right now, this verse number 13 is not about your soul's salvation. Okay, and those false prophets that want to preach a works gospel will point to this verse and say, see, you've got to endure, brother. You know, you've got to live a life, a faithful life. You've got to be in church. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to serve the Lord. And if you don't do it till death, man, I don't, I don't know. You know, you've got to endure to the end to be saved. That's what the Bible said. Well, hold on. What's the context of what we're reading? People are killing believers. This is talking about the salvation of the flesh. It's talking about, you know, seeing it through to the rapture so you would, you would have your flesh saved, as it were, and being delivered by Christ rather than being killed by the Antichrist and, and, his, and you know, the ungodly world. And we'll look at this later on. You'll, you'll see later on, this is not about salvation of the soul. You know, this is, of, I mean, of course not. Right? Salvation of the soul is based upon Jesus Christ. It's not about you enduring. It's about you placing your faith in Christ and Christ having paid for it all. Your past, future and present sins, you know. So the context is clear, I believe, but we'll see this later on. Look at verse number 14. You say, well, man, hearing about this stuff, dying, and it gets me worried, it gets me scared. Is that, you know, well, what's our job? Verse number 14. Because listen, if we're being persecuted for the name of Christ, aren't we going to be like trying to get out, out of the persecution? Aren't we going to like get, get out, flee and things like that? Say, so why are we fleeing? Is it because we're scared? Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay? Listen to me. If, you're, if, this, if this preaching gets you scared, if the end times gets you scared, pay attention because you're going to be empowered by God and you're going to be out there preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. That's what you're going to be empowered to do. If you face persecution here in Sydney, then you go to Brisbane and you preach the gospel there. You get persecution there. You go to Melbourne and you preach the gospel there. Okay? You get preached in every city here in Australia. You go to New Zealand. You preach the gospel there. All right? And that's, that's how the gospel is going to get out to the whole world is because we're being pushed and we're going out. Hey, it doesn't sound like we're scared. It sounds like we want the name of God to be known in the whole world. Praise God. Hey, that's a spirit of power. And of course, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Hey, yes, we'll be afflicted in these last days or whatever that last generation of believers will be. Hey, but the Bible says, look, be a partaker of the afflictions. You know, God wants us to, to, be, to suffer for Him. And the Lord will make sure that we're rewarded for our service, for our loyal service to Him. The Bible says, hey, He's given us a spirit of power and of love. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to be working in us. If we're that last generation, the Holy Spirit's going to be working in us. We're not going to be afraid. We're going to be out there doing the works of God. All right? Verse number 15, Matthew 24, verse 15. Now, this is important. 
Because people look at the end, they, people look at the nations and they say, well, look what's going on with Iran and look what's going on with Syria, look what's going on with Russia, you know, what's going on here? Oh, look now, there's cryptocurrency and, you know, there's all this and it's, oh man, you know, at the end times, you know, the world, the world could be at war in any time now, at the, you know, at the end time. Listen, look, watch, you know, be someone that, that's aware of what's going on in this world. But Jesus Christ tells us exactly when we're going to know when we're in these last times. Okay? It's, you don't need to worry about every little development in this world. Okay? Don't be someone that's always afraid and look at all these things. But look at verse 15. Jesus tells us when we're going to know. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Jesus says, look, I'm going to tell you when you're going to know is when you see this so-called abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay, maybe you guys want to go to Daniel the prophet. Let's go to Daniel chapter nine, please. Daniel chapter nine. Daniel chapter nine. Because listen, there's always wars. There's always famines. There's always earthquakes. There's always these things going on. Okay, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. It could happen a hundred years. I don't know. I don't know. You know. All I know is when I see the abomination of desolation, then I'll know it's, gonna, it's happening, okay? And let's look at the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Let's learn about this, the, the abomination of desolation. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, verse 27, Daniel 9, 27. The Bible says, and he, and by the way, the he here is the beast, is the Antichrist. I don't have time to go through that now. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, this is about Daniel's 70th week. Too much, we don't have time to go through all, okay? But there's one week left. How many days in a week? Seven days, okay? But when it comes to this prophecy, it's not about seven days in a week, it's seven years in a week. Seven years, okay? But it says say here, uh, for many in one week, so in the seven years, this Antichrist will make a covenant with the people. Makes sense because he's out there conquering the nations. So he makes some type of agreement that, you know, he becomes the king of all things. And then it says, and in the midst of the week, Hey, in the middle, in the midst, midst means middle, in the midst of the week. So three and a half years into this final seven year period, shall he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. There's the, the, the abomination of desolation, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, please go to Daniel chapter 11. Let's learn a little bit more about this Antichrist, this beast. But I want you to notice, when does it take place? In the middle of the seven years. That's when we're going to know we're in this time. Maybe we'll have a, you know, we'll have a good feel we're in that period. But we'll definitely know when this takes place. Okay? We'll definitely know this, this takes place. What happens during the middle of this week? Okay? Now, uh, just to stop there for a minute. The beginning of sorrows. All right? The four seals, you know, the four horsemen, that all takes place for the first three and a half years. Okay? Then we're at the abomination of desolation. Then we're when the Antichrist really comes into play. Really, when he really comes into the picture. But look at Daniel 11, verse 31. Daniel 11, verse 31. It says here, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, that they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And by the way, this is just a, a, like a statue, like an image of this Antichrist, which he calls people to come and worship at. Okay? We haven't got time to look at that. But drop down to verse 36. Verse 36. So what happens? What happens when he does this? Verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, the king being the Antichrist, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So the Antichrist comes and he exalts himself in the midst of this week. And he says, hey, I'm above every God. I, in fact, he says he's God. And that's how he blasphemes um, the Lord God. All right. Now, that's the midst of the week. When you see this happen, 
You'll be like, man, that's it. We're in it now. This is it. You know, let's get out there and preach the gospel you know, to every nation. Let's make sure we use the last times, the last you know, years that we have or whatever length we have. In fact, it's probably a few months at this point. But let's use whatever we have left to get out there and, and preach the, the word of God. Get out there and win as many souls as possible. Look, I'll be quitting my job. I'll be, I'll be out there just preaching the gospel. That's all I'll be concerned about at this time period. Okay? And you say, well, what if, what if you get caught for doing that and you get beheaded and all that? Well, who cares? You know, I um, lose my life for Christ. I'll have an exciting story when I'm in heaven. All right. If you pass away in your sleep. So how did you pass away? Oh, I just in my sleep. You know, but, well, man, I, I lost my head. You know, I was, you know, I was on my way to Melbourne preaching the gospel and then someone found me. And, oh, that's an exciting story. Right. Hey, you get rewarded in heaven. But anyway, back to Matthew 24, verse 16. Matthew 24, verse 16. And the Antichrist is going to set himself up in Jerusalem. All right. Why? Because that's, you know, where Christ was. So, of course, the Antichrist wants to do everything that Christ does. And that's why when we get to verse 16, that's why we now mention Judea. The Bible says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. This tells me that the persecution in Judea is probably going to be pretty bad. Okay, because that's where the Antichrist is going to be set up. So if you find yourself in that area, I don't know why, but if you do, anyone else in Judea should flee into the mountains. Verse 17, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let them which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now just quickly on verse 19, I've heard people say, that believe in a post-trib rapture or whatever, say, I'm not going to have any kids because, you know, I reckon it's just a few years away. And the Bible says, woe unto them that are with child. Listen, the context is Judea, all right? If you're not in Judea, just have the kids, man. You know, just have the kids. Train them up to preach the gospel. You know, train them up to be those people that go out there and do the great works of God and let them earn great rewards in heaven. Don't, you know, why would you hold that back? Anyway. But uh, so you can see that in Judea, obviously they have to be concerned about their flight. Verse number 20 being in, not being in the winter. So I assume it'd be harder to escape during that time. Neither on the Sabbath day, because in that part of the world, obviously they, they respect the Sabbath. Everything's shut down. I guess you're not going to be able to catch a train or you know, get out of there as easily if, you, if it was any other day of the week. Okay? But I just want you to notice that it's got the ye and it's got the them. Okay? But of course, there are believers in every nation. You know, there's even believers of Christ in Judea, okay? And many of them, they can't, it's illegal to preach the gospel in, in Israel. It's illegal, okay? And there are many Palestinians that are saved. There are, there are many people in that place of the world. So obviously, these instructions apply to them, okay? Verse number 21, verse number 21. So as they're escaping, the Antichrist sets himself up. He lifts himself up to be God. Verse number 21. For then, look at this. For then shall be great tribulation. Hold on. Shouldn't there be a rapture before this tribulation period? Did, did we read about a rapture before that, guys? Because that's what they say. Before the tribulation, Christ is going to come back and take his saints. Hold on. Well, if, if that's the case, why doesn't Jesus even mention it? Okay. What we see is the beginning of sorrows. And in the midst of the week, the Antichrist exalts himself to be God. They start killing the believers of Christ. Anybody that, has that, you know, that you know, stands up for his name. And then shall be great tribulation. That is the tribulation. The believers being persecuted by the Antichrist. Okay? Look at this. Such as what was not since the beginning of the, the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. Who's doing the persecution? It's the Antichrist. It's not God pouring out his wrath on this world just yet. It's the devil, it's the Antichrist, it's the ungodly world persecuting believers. That's what the Great Tribulation is. All right? Now look, it says here, Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. Now we looked at the book of Daniel. Sorry guys, go back to Daniel. Go back to Daniel chapter 12. Super important for you to see this. Okay? Because the book of Daniel, especially the last half, those that, that don't believe like I do, will say to you, oh, Daniel's not for you. Daniel's for the non-believing Jews. That's why the book of Daniel often says, when God's speaking to Daniel, God will use the terms, thy people. You know, Daniel was a Jew, so therefore thy people of Daniel are the Jews. Or 
non-believing Jews in that sense. Well, it makes no sense. Daniel was a believer, right? Daniel was a man of faith. Daniel was someone to say, Daniel's, Daniel's in heaven. Now we're going to see him, you know. But anyway, go to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Because here's the thing. The Bible defines for us who thy people are. Okay? We don't need some scholar to tell us who thy people is. We just need the word of God. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, Michael the archangel, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. There it is, thy people. Look at this. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that the same time. Doesn't that sound like what we just read in Matthew 24? This is the greatest tribulation, the greatest tri trial ever. But look at this. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. That's the Jews. Thy people shall be... Well, let's have a look. Shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Hey, listen. Are you written in the book of life? If you are, you're the people of Daniel. That's what the Bible says. How can you say the non-believing Jews are written in the Lamb's book of life? What in the world? The Bible defines things for us. Listen, the Bible's easy as long as we put away the false teachings, the confusion that comes from a lot of this preaching. And listen to me, the pre-tribulation rapture, as far as being taught within, you know, um, you know uh, modern like, denominations like, like, let's say, Baptists and Presbyterians and Anglicans, it's only something that's been taught the last hundred years. Okay, since the Schofield Reference Bible, which came, I think, in the 19, 1912 or something, you know. And even then, it, will, it took a while for certain churches to accept the teaching of the preacher rapture. Okay, and, and the Baptists were some of the last to accept it. Okay, so really, that teaching's only been around for 100 years. Okay, but of course, for us, 100 years is several generations. So we have several generations of pastors that have been teaching a pre-tribulation rapture, even though the Bible never teaches that. Okay. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Thy people is everyone that shall be found written in the book. Go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. Who's in the book? All well, the non-believing Jews. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. He that overcometh. Okay, that's important. He that overcometh. The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. How are you in the Lord's book? How are you? You're someone that overcomes, right? You're someone that overcometh. You say, what does that mean? How do I overcome? I'll just read it to you. 1 John 5.5. 5. The Bible says, who is he that overcometh the world? Hey, that's a good question. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Hey man, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, if that's your Savior, then you're someone that's overcome already. You've overcome. Okay? And your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? And you're the people of Daniel. That's how it comes together. Do the Jews, do the non-believing Jews believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Of course not. You can see, who's Matthew 24 written to, guys? You know, I mean, this is crystal clear. But like I said, I'm wasting time trying to debunk the arguments that the other positions have. Go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 22. Matthew 24, verse 22. And if you have any questions for me, please, you know, after the service or... I'm here this whole week. Call me up. Catch up with me if you want. If, if you don't understand this, please, I want to make sure this is well understood. And if you, if you still, if you disagree with me, that's fine as well, you know, if you disagree with me. But Matthew 24, verse 22. Matthew 24, verse 22. And except those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. Remember when we read, he that endureth to the end shall be saved? Well, what does it say here? That and unless those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. Is this talking about the salvation of the soul? No, it's talking about the salvation of your body, your flesh, okay? Again, confirmed for us in the Bible. But... But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So the Lord's going to have mercy on us and He's going to shorten those days of tribulation. Okay? So we, we can survive. Okay? Not all of us are going to lose our lives, but many of us will also survive because we're going to be there to, be, to experience the rapture, to experience the resurrection. Okay? Now, those that teach a pre-tribulation rapture will say, well, in verse 22, the elect there are the Jews. They're the non-believing Jews, the elect. All right, so 
Let's have debunk that as well, right? Let's debunk that one. Um, I'll, I'll just read to you guys. Romans 11 verse 7 says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh after, or seeketh for. Israel does, has not obtained what it seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. That's a perfect reference for you to know that Israel, non-believing Israel, are not the election. Because right? it said, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it. How can Israel be the election when Israel has not obtained it, but the election has obtained it? You say, what's, what is obtained what? Salvation. Okay. Israel, Old Testament, uh, not Old Testament, um, you know, 1948, Israel has not obtained it, but the election has obtained it. Okay. Now I'm going to read to you from Colossians 3.11. Colossians 3.11, which says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is in all and in all. I love that. It doesn't matter about who you are, your background, your nationality, your ethnicity, how rich you are, you know, whether you're bond or free. It doesn't matter if we're in Christ, we're all one. And then it says in verse number 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. What does the Bible call us? Whether Jew or Greek, Gentile, whatever you are, if you're in Christ, the Bible calls you the elect of God. So how can it be the Jews, say non-believing Jews, how can it be? All right, no, it's the believing Jews and the believing Gentiles and the believing of everything, okay, that make up the elect of God. If you're a believer, we're all one in Jesus Christ. Back to Matthew 24, verse 23. Matthew 24, verse 30, 20, 23. So for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Who are the elect? Those that are in Christ. Okay, God loves us. He's going to shorten those days for us. But still, I mean, that's where you're going to earn maximum rewards, getting the gospel out there in the face of persecution. It's the best time to do it. All right. Verse number 23. Verse number 23. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, that they should deceive the very elect. Now, does the Bible say that the elect, the saved, are going to be deceived by the Antichrist? Are, are we going to take the mark of the beast? No, we're not going to be deceived, okay? It says, if it, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. If it was possible, meaning it's not possible, okay? It's not possible for us to take the mark of the beast. And uh, I've heard people say, well, see... This is not for us because, you know, we're not called to be saved by not taking the mark of the, you know, and mark of the beast. And they say, well, it's not, it's not a, we're not going to be deceived, but maybe we're going to be tempted because when we're, when we're hungry, we see our children starving, then we're going to want, you know, I'm going to take that mark of the beast. I mean, is that, do you find that in the Bible? If we're going to base our doctrine, our beliefs on the word of God, do you see believers, any believers, whatever believers that you think they are in the tribulation, taking the mark of the beast? It's not in the Bible. Why would you base doctrines or beliefs on something that's not in the Bible? Let's base it upon the things that are in the Bible. Okay, the things that are in the Bible. And again, the Lord will empower us in this time. There's going to be a pouring out of the Holy... I'm not talking about the Charismatics here. I'm talking about all the Pentecostals. I'm saying there's going to be a true pouring out of the Holy Ghost in us. I haven't got time to go through that. That's in Acts chapter 2 if you're curious. And we're going to be able to do great works for the Lord. Okay. But let's go to verse number 25. Verse number 25. Matthew 24, 25. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. That's Jesus in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Now, what's funny about verse 26 is if someone says to you, Jesus is in the secret chambers, don't believe it. Okay, why? Because when Jesus comes back, it's not going to be a secret. Okay, it's going to, everyone's going to see it. Everyone's going to know when Christ comes back. And we'll prove this shortly, okay? And what's funny about the pre-tribulation rapture is they also call it the secret rapture. <laughs> the secret. No one else, no one's going to know. You know, it's going to be, um, you know, twinkling in a moment, you know, twinkling of the eye. We're going to be caught up. You know, no one's going to know. It's going to be this huge secret. Jesus says, it's not a secret. <laughs> he says, it's not a secret. And yet, it's funny how they take the things that Jesus says and flip it on its head. But verse number 27, why would it not be a secret? Because look at verse 27. 
For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is like lightning. If you guys see it's lightning, it comes from one side, it shines, and then, you know, the light travels. But for a brief moment, it's all there. It's all visible, right? Uh, it's traveled down, but it's just, it's like fixed for a moment and then it disappears, right? You see the entire thing. And he says, that's how it's going to be. It's going to be this bright light, this great showing, you know, as east. And by the way, this is how some people kind of say, well, how is every eye going to see Christ when he just comes down? How is the whole world going to see? Well, there's the answer. As lightning cometh from the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I believe that Christ is going to go through the whole world. Okay, and, 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 and rapture his believers from the east to the west, whatever that looks like, you know, on, on the map of Christ. So we're going to skip verse 28 for now because I want to get to that toward the end. Verse 28, but let's go to verse 29. Verse 29. So we saw the tribulation, the Antichrist persecuting the believers. Okay, there was no rapture before that. All right, there's nothing there from in Matthew 24, verse 29, verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. What happens immediately after the tribulation? The sun and the moon darken, right? And the stars fall from heaven. We saw that. Go to Revelation chapter 6 again. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12. We've seen the first five seals. Now we're up to seal number 6. Seal number 6, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. What are we going to see? If the Bible is consistent, we should see the same events, right? And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree cast of her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together. So the heaven or the skies departs like, a, like if you open up a scroll, it, all, it, it opens up. Why would it open up? Why is it going to open up? It's because Christ is coming, right? That's why it's opening up. And it says, And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. All right? So we see this in Revelation chapter 6 perfectly. Perfectly lining up with Matthew 24. The sun and moon being darkened, the stars falling from heaven. Go back to Matthew 24 now. Matthew 24 verse 30. Verse number 30. So we see the, the heavens being opened or departed like a scroll when it's rolled together. And verse number 30 in Matthew 24. Matthew 24 verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That's Jesus speaking about himself. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Pay attention. All the, earth, all the tribes of the earth mourn. Listen, it's not a secret. All the tribes, all the nations of the earth will look at Christ and mourn. Hey, that's not a good thing. Now, for the believers, we're going to be rejoicing. Man, we're for, good. It's over. <laughs> the tribulation is over. I'm going to be with Christ. But when it comes to the non-believing world, they're going to mourn. We'll see soon why. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hey, they will see Jesus himself coming with power and great glory. Go back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. Let's keep reading. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. It says here, we saw that all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty man and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Man, the, the world's just going to be afraid. They're going to go and try to hide, right? In, in their bunkers and whatever else they have. Verse number 16. And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Hey, who do they see? They saw Jesus. And they said, look, hide us from his wrath. Okay. Verse number 17. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? That's why they're afraid. They know now God Christ is going to pour out his wrath on this world. Hey, the world was persecuting God's people and now Christ is coming, pouring out his wrath on them. That's what's going on. Okay, so understand a few key things now. Beginning of sorrows, midst of the week, the Antichrist, you know, uh, exalts himself to be God. The tribulation, the persecution of believers, right? Then at the end of the tribulation, the sun and moon are darkened, right? The heavens are opened up. The Lord comes in great power and glory and these guys are freaking out. 
Okay? And he says, the day of his wrath, the day of his wrath is come. Now we're up to the wrath of God. We believe in a post-trib, so after the tribulation, pre-wrath. We'll be raptured before Jesus Christ pours out his wrath on this earth. Okay? Are we going to, are we going to miss the tribulation? No. We're going to face the tribulation and hopefully do a great job during the tribulation as his people. Then we'll be raptured. And we'll see, soon see the rapture there. And then the God will pour out his wrath. Okay? Back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And of course, the wrath are the seven trumpets, the seven vials of the book of Revelation. Again, we don't have time to go through that, but many of you will be familiar with those passages. Back to Matthew 24, verse 31. Matthew 24, verse 31. So Christ is coming in the clouds. What do we expect to see? The rapture. Okay, being with the Lord forever. Verse 31. And he, that's been Jesus, shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. Who's the elect? The believers. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, I need you to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the most famous passage of the rapture. Whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, post-trib, pre-raph, we all agree. We all agree that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is about the rapture. Okay? Now, when we saw Matthew 24, we saw Christ coming, right? He's descending. We saw him coming in the clouds. We saw the angels. We saw the trumpet being blown, right? And we saw the gathering from one heaven to the other. All right? We saw five elements there in Matthew 24. Now, if that's the rapture in Matthew 24, then that should line up with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which everyone agrees is the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Look at this. For the Lord himself shall descend. There it is, number one. From heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. So we've got the angels, number two. And with the trump of God, the trumpet, number three. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. We've been risen up there. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's number five, the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Praise God for his promise. We see the attributes of Matthew 24, his coming. Line up perfectly with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Which everyone agrees is the rapture. So why deny Matthew 24? You know? Hey, let's just believe what the Bible says. All right. Now, some will say, well, hold on. If you go back to Matthew 24, I've heard this argument. Matthew 24, verse 31. Matthew 24, verse 31. They say, no, 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 no. This isn't about, you know, believers taken from earth to heaven. Because in Matthew 24, verse 31, it said at the end there, from one end of heaven to the other. So they say, well, Matthew 24 is about Revelation 19. And sorry if it gets a bit confusing. When Christ comes on a white horse and he comes with all the saints, they, they say that that's Christ gathering all the saints from one end of the heaven to the other end. And that's why they're all coming down in Revelation chapter 19. But this is why God's given us multiple gospels. Okay, So I'm going to read to you from uh, Mark 13 verse 27. This is the same teaching of Christ. Parallel passage at the same time. Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 13 verse 27. The Bible says, And then shall he send his angels, yep, and shall gather together his elect, yep, from the four winds. We saw that in Matthew 24. Look at this. From the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. What did it say? From the uttermost part of the earth. From the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Okay, this is a parallel passage here in Mark 13, verse 27. You may want to jot that down if, in case that person or somebody you know, tries to argue that point. But we see, no, Christ is taking his believers from the earth up to heaven, up to the clouds to be with him. Okay, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Back to Matthew 24, Matthew 24, 32. Matthew 24, verse 32. Matthew 24, verse 32. Jesus now says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender he, and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So when you see a fig tree and, you, and, and it starts to bring forth its leaves, 
you know that it's near summer. It's basically what it says, right? Because a fig tree is a seasonal fruit. We know when it starts to, to grow, we know where the season's changing and summer's close by. Verse 33, so, so likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. So Jesus wants us to know when the end is, right? That's why he's given us Matthew 24. That's why he's given us all these events. So he tells us about the persecution. He tells us about the Antichrist. So we can know these things when, it, when the time comes, okay? I mean, how, how wicked does it now sound to say, well, Matthew 24, don't read that, it's not for you. Jesus wants us to know, okay? He wants us to know. And notice that he gave the parable of the fig tree. Just out, out of curiosity, go back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 13. Revelation chapter 6, verse 13. It said, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast of her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. I only point that out just to show you the consistency of the Bible. You know, Jesus Christ speaks of the fig tree in the parable there in Matthew 24, and straight after the sun and moon being darkened, and the Apostle John does exactly the same thing. You know, it's all tied in together perfectly. All right. Matthew 24, verse 34. Matthew 24, verse 34. Matthew 24, verse 34. Verily, truly, that very means truly, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. I mean, that should be an easy thing to understand, but let me just explain a couple of things. Some people, some, some people I, I don't really come across, I don't know who, who they are, but apparently a lot of so-called Christians believe, they, they don't believe in a literal millennium in the future. They believe the millennium is right now. And they believe all these things in Matthew 24 took place like shortly after Christ ascended up to heaven. Okay, well, 70 AD. They'll teach all these things. Now, I do believe there is a double fulfillment in some of these things. I do believe some of these things do apply, can apply to 70 AD. But, I mean, Jesus did not come back on the clouds in 70 AD, right? That's still, that's still a future thing to come. But verse 34, the reason, that, the reason they, they come to that idea is it says here that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So they say, see, the generation that Jesus is speaking to will not pass till all those things be fulfilled. And since they did pass, then all these things must have been fulfilled already. I mean, look, I think it's quite clear what generation he's talking about. He just finished saying, if you see these things, all right, the same generation that sees these end time events will be the same generation that will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Okay? I mean, just keep it within the context, you'll be fine. Verse 35, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Beautiful words, just confirmation. This is important to learn. It's not going to change. Okay, it's not going to pass away. Verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Just another a passage there, just again, showing the distinction between the Father and the Son. Jesus says, look, I don't know, but the Father knows. How can Jesus be the Father? <laughs> if he says, I don't know, the day or the hour... Now, maybe he knows it now, I'm not sure, but he says the Father knows. The Father knows, right? Only. Verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, Noah is just Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall all the coming... So, sorry, so shall also the coming of the, son, uh, of the Son of Man be. So just like the days of Noah. Noah knew. Noah knew the flood was coming. Noah was preparing the ark, right? He knew his plan. He knew the Lord was going to destroy the earth. And he was prepared. He was there working. He was doing the work of God. Hey, and if you're a believer, you need to do the work of God. You know these things are coming, especially in those days, these days. If you're, if you're the, that generation that lives in it, you better be like Noah building that ark, okay? But when it comes to the unbelieving world, it's going to come as a surprise. They're not going to be prepared for it. Okay? Just like the days of Noe, the unbelieving world is not going to be prepared for the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I want you to... Yeah, actually, let's do this because... Um, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Why are we going there? Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the famous rapture passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 just continues the same teaching. All right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. Now, our pre-tribulation brethren, and I love my pre-trib brethren, please never think I don't, I do, okay? But they'll say, we don't, we don't know, you know, Jesus is, coming, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night, you've heard that before? 
He's coming. As, so we don't know when the thief's coming. If we knew the thief was coming, we, would, we, wouldn't, we, you know, we wouldn't allow him to break in. We'd call the police if we knew the thief was coming. You know, he says, we don't know. That's why it could be happening at any moment. It could happen today. It could happen in five minutes. It could happen at the end of this sermon. It could happen at the end of the week. We don't know because we don't know when the thief is going to break in and steal. Now, we just saw what Jesus said about the days of Noah. It's those that were not prepared. But Noah, the believer, he was prepared. He knew it was coming. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's look at this about the thief in the night because Jesus also mentions it in Matthew 24 later on. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So that's true. What our preachery brethren are saying is true. It's coming as a thief in the night. Okay? But, verse number 3, For when they, hey, who's they? It's not us okay the the the, uh, the book of Thessalonians was written by Paul to the Thessalonian church and by extension it's written for us because we're a church so when he says for when they it's talking about those that are non-believers the unsaved world right look at this for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh upon them not upon you upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape all right so is it coming as a thief in the night? Yes, but it's coming as a thief in the night to them, not to us, to them. Okay? And you say, well, I'll prove it. Verse number four. But ye, brethren, you, brethren, you save people, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. He says, look, it's not going to overtake you as a thief. You're not in darkness, brethren. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Oh, no, I shouldn't be reading it. Hey, look, what are you kidding me? Yeah, you will be in darkness if you, you know, um, ignore the words of Christ. Verse number five. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. That's why the thief's not going to break in, because we're not of darkness. The thief comes in when it's dark, and it's the, it's the unsaved world that's in darkness. We're not in darkness. Verse number six. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Hey, does Jesus want us to be paying attention and knowing when things are coming? Yes, he does. He wants us to be aware, okay? And the thief's not going to come in the night for us because we're in the light. But the unsaved world, yeah, they're the ones. So when our, saved, when our pre-true brethren say, it's like a thief in the night, I don't know what's going on, you know? They're just lumping themselves with the non-believers. Why would you? How ridiculous. I don't blame them. A lot of people don't look into this. A lot of people, like, they've just been taught by their pastors. And many of those pastors are good men. I'm not saying they're not, okay? They're doing the best they can, but they're not preparing their flock for the end times. Now, I'm not saying we necessarily are going to be that people, the last generation. If we're, if, even if we're not, we should prepare for tribulation anyway. You know, we could have local tribulation. We could have local problems, you know, and we should prepare ourselves, our hearts, seeking the Lord, doing His work. It really doesn't matter if we're the last generation or not. We still have the same task to do, and that's preach the gospel and see people saved. Back, back to Matthew 24, please. Matthew 24. And we're just going to skip a few verses, and I will get to that later on. I need to, I need to hurry up. So let's skip to verse 43. Let's skip to verse 43, another parable. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in, in what watch the thief would come... Thief? Why would he mention the thief here? Paul mentions the thief in, in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Why would Paul mention it there? Because Jesus mentioned it in Matthew 24. Okay? Our Paul is getting his teaching from Christ in Matthew 24. Man, our pre-tree brethren love Paul. They love the book of Thessalonians. But why won't you go to the book that he got his teaching from? Okay? Anyway, let's keep going. The thief, right? We watched the thief would come. He would, he would have watched and would not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken up. Verse number 44. Look at this. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant? Do we want to be faithful and wise servants? Who is he? Whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord when he cometh find, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him a ruler over all his goods. So, hey, man, if, if the Lord watches, you know, sees us watching, waiting, preparing ourselves, getting the gospel, doing the work, preparing the ark, for, we're saved already, but getting other people into the ark, you know, figurative speaking, 
then the Lord will give, make us rulers. You know, we're going to rule and reign with Christ in the millennium. All right. So there's a reward for those that are laboring and getting ready for the Lord's return. But look at verse number 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Now, before I keep reading, some people take these passages and they start thinking, they get confused. They start thinking, maybe we can lose our salvation. Okay, they don't, you know, and again, when it comes to a parable, you've got to be very careful. Okay, you build your doctrine on things that are crystal clear. And parables are there to help support what we already know as the truth. Okay, because you'll soon see that this wicked servant, what's it called him here? This evil servant, he'll be cast into hell. Okay. So if we know that believers cannot be cast into hell, can this evil servant be a believer? No, it's, it's a non-believer, okay? But he says, well, it's, it's the Lord's, the servants of the Lord. Yeah, but in the story of the parable, okay? For illustration purpose, okay? He's the servant of the Lord. But of course, you then need to apply that to the truths that we have others in the Bible. So you take a story, you can only go by what Christ says in that story and then align it with the doctrines that we hold Verse number 49, let's, what does this evil servant do? And shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Hey, who did we see are not aware of the hour? Who did we see that he will come as a thief in the night to? To the non-believers, right? Ties in perfectly to that. Verse 51, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's a reference to being cast into hell. The weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Okay. You guys have been super patient with me. Let's keep going. We're going to go back to verse 40. We're almost done. Back to verse 40. Because we were looking at the coming of Christ. Right. Look at verse 40. The Bible says, Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. What does that sound like? Be two people, one taken, the other left. Sounds like the rapture, right? Two women shall be grinding at the mill, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore. That's what Paul said to the Thessalonian church. Right? Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Okay? So this is the rapture. You know, some people are being taken, and others are being left. Now, we also skipped verse 28. Let's go back to verse 28, please. Verse 28. We saw that verse 28 did, uh, was associated with the coming of Christ. Now look at this, verse 28. For whithersoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. I say, what is that about? It's not complicated, okay? Let's go to Luke 17. Luke 17 really ties these verses together for us. So one will be taken and another left. And whithersoever the carcass or the dead body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Because eagles are a bird of prey, you know, like vultures, they'll come and eat the dead, the dead carcass, okay? This is an il illustration, okay? It's, it's just a picture, all right? Picture of what? Luke 17, please. Luke 17, verse 34. Luke 17, verse 34. Jesus teaches on this elsewhere in Luke 17, 34. He says, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. So this lines up with what we saw in Matthew 24, right? Verse 36, two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord? I mean, that's a good question. One will be taken, right? Say, where? Where, Lord? Where are they taken? And he said unto them, whithersoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Okay, same thing, right? The body or the carcass and the eagles, the birds of prey. The illustration is there when you have all these eagles and they see a dead body, they all gather to that dead body and eat, eat of it, okay? A picture of what? Of the people that have been taken are going to be like eagles that are gathering to that carcass or to that body, okay? And that, that's, that's, it's just an illustration. It's just a picture of Christ. When Christ descends in the clouds, His believers will be taken and gathered up with Him like eagles, you know? So... That's Matthew 24. Thank you so much for your patience. But I just want to leave you with this, guys. You know, if this freaks you out, if, the, if you get scared by this, you need to ask the Lord to give you the right spirit. Okay, it does not give us a spirit of fear. Okay, but of, of power and of, a sound, of love and a sound mind. Okay, is that right? Power is, anyway, you guys know what I mean. Okay, make sure, look, if this gives you fear, look, let's just go to the Lord. The Lord will strengthen you. I'll tell you, listen, there was a time when I believed the pre-trib rapture. 
and I had to deny it because it was not in the Word of God. And I found this, you know, it's like I read Matthew 24 for the first time. Like, what in the world? How do I miss all these things, right? And then at the beginning, I was a little afraid. You know, I was a little, because you're prepared to miss it all. Okay, and all of a sudden, well, now I'm going to go through Oh, what in the world? I mean, we're not going to go through God's wrath. You know, that's for another time. But listen, in due time, when you start to just understand the Word of God, God will work in you. God will strengthen you. Okay, and if you're going to go through a hard time, don't you think you're going to draw closer to the Lord? Don't you think you're going to want to be walking with the Lord and, and being empowered and being in fellowship with the Lord? Hey, knowing the truth of the rapture really encouraged me as a believer to be a stronger believer, to be more faithful to the Lord. Okay, because if it was in my time, I wanted to make sure that I was spiritually prepared. And like I said, even if it's not in my time, at least I'm prepared for anything that might come my way, any other tribulation that might come my way. So please, you know, make sure you, if you're afraid, you take it to the Lord. If you don't believe what I preach today, please ask me afterwards. If you have any questions, you want to catch up with me during this week, uh, I'd be happy to catch up with you. All right, let's pray.